for the last 35 years, I've been making uh, feature films, TV, episodics, commercials, music videos, Ford's first 3D ad, and even the mighty Morphin Power Rangers. No, no need to clap. Um, <laughs> Anyway, for about a year, my son Ben, who's now a successful web designer, thought I was the coolest dad in the world. Let me show you why. Uh, since this is a technical Chautauqua, uh, I must tell you that Ben, at this point, was defending the Zeo crystals from the evil master Vile. I cannot remember the galaxy, but I'll get back to you on that. In any case, um, I realized that I had worked for everybody but one person, myself. So. Uh, with the advent of digital cinematography, digital filmmaking, when things became more affordable, I decided to set out and make two personal films, films that I've just had in my craw, that I just had to get out. And both films are about objects, objects that have been imbued with the spirit and the creative energy of their creators, a timeless creative energy. One very large, an ocean liner, and the other very small, the electric guitar. And both possess what I believe is a creative energy that transcends time. So the first film was called Lady in Waiting, the first of three films I made on the SS United States. It was a PBS national special, uh, and it aired uh, with a penetration of 91% of American households, which is just what we wanted. We did not make this film to make money. We made this film to save a great national icon, the SS United States which to me and the other folks in the SS United States Conservancy, uh, we believe is as significant an American icon and invention as the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty. The difference uh, it's, is that it's become forgotten. And we set out to alter history in just a small way. The second film, which isn't out yet but will be soon, is called Turn It Up, and we hope it will be the definitive film on the electric guitar. It's the film I wanted to make about the electric guitar, and uh, it eschews the, the, the current wisdom, which is that documentary films have to have a narrative through line, you know, a crossword contest with a beginning, middle, and an end. Somebody wins, somebody loses, and all that. This is about the passion and the obsession with the electric guitar, something I have and something I wanted to share and explain, not just to guitar players, but to everybody out there. Anyway, where does this creative energy come from? This is Luxury Liner Row in the late 50s. My dad took me here, and these were all ships of state, each one representing its country. And the third from the bottom was the SS United States. So think about it, six-year-old boy, little boy, great big ship. And I took a look at that thing. The others were cool, but something about the SS United States just clobbered me. Maybe it was the creative energy that went into building this ship, which is arguably the greatest ocean liner of all time. Maybe it was something else, but the razor-sharp bow and the fact that it looked like it was traveling 60 miles an hour, uh, sitting still, just got me. And I never forgot that day. Uh, and I followed this ship through my entire life. OK, let me tell you a little bit about that ship. It's 990 feet long. It's five city blocks long. And it's 100 feet longer than the Titanic was. Um, how many of you out there remember the SS United States? Extra credit. Um, well, the reason the rest of you don't is because A, it never broke, B, it was never late, and C, it didn't sink. <laughs> you know, the ones that stay on the top of the water are never as famous as the ones that, you know. <laughs> anyway, it represented the epitome of the American can-do spirit, American efficiency, creativity, and it sailed between 1952 and 1969. And to tell you a little bit more about it, here's a clip from the upcoming film, this is actually work print, uh, of uh, SS United States, Symbol of America. It was a revelation, sort of like seeing a, a Van Gogh or something of the kind, and, and this, this was it. The world's fastest ocean liner, the SS United States. It was such a beautiful thing to behold. Anybody who had any sense of engineering or design of ships. The elegance and the champagne and the light and speed. Scotch and sodas at 10 a.m. What a majestic symbol the ship was. It was a top secret vessel. The whole shape was classified. She will be capable of transporting a complete army division of 14,000 men, 10,000 miles, without stopping for fuel, water, or food. 
definitely a kind of combination of a you know, elegant luxury liner and a Cold War weapon. It was just that kind of a ship. Yes, she was. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1975, Coming back to New York to be a graduate film student, I bothered the Maritime Administration for six months. It actually took me a real long time to find out what had become of the ship, because it had been taken out of service in 69. And that's me with my head in a bag. I think I was changing film, but maybe I just had my head in a bag. And, <laughs> and that was the first day of shooting on Lady in Waiting. I started in 75. I finished in 2008. I'm slow, but I'm good. <laughs> um, and that's a clip from the local paper to prove I really did it. But this is the ballroom of the ship on that day in 1975, and this material actually made it into the film. And what's significant about this, it's a very rare shot of the ship after it was laid up and before it was gutted, because the interiors have been completely gutted. It had more asbestos than anything made by man up to that point. And uh, it took uh, some folks in Turkey and the Ukraine to get rid of it. But the ship is now back, and it's sitting in Philadelphia. Time has not been kind to the ship. Here's a transition from then to now. The hull is actually the strongest hull ever put on a passenger ship. And though it looks terrible outside, Norwegian Cruise Line, just a few years back, decided to bring the ship back to service. It was actually going to sail again, and they were going to have it be, once again, the fastest ship in the world, a record, by the way, that it still holds. Uh, it broke the record for crossing the Atlantic and beat the Queen Mary by 10 hours, and it could have done better. Um, in any case, um, there's a whole mythology about this ship, and before I tell you how the ship was very threatened when Norwegian Cruise Line did not make good on its progress, one of the things I'm exploring both in the ship film and in the guitar film is the mythology of these objects. And one of the myths about the United States is how fast it could go. I asked hundreds of people how fast the ship could go. A modern day cruise ship, most of them go about 20 knots. The United States could do that in reverse. Debate continues to rage over the ship's top speed. Because it's one of those um, mythical subjects that all fans of this ship talk about when they get together. She could go 50 miles an hour. I know what I would like it to be. 36, 40, 42 knots. That's pretty amazing. There are those who claim to have been on the ship when she was doing 40 knots. They kicked her up to about 42 knots on her maiden voyage. And you could feel it. People say that she went as fast as 50 knots. Her absolute top speed for two hours during her sea trials in the spring of 52 was 43 knots, which is about 46 miles an hour. But that would take huge amounts of power and fuel consumption. And then she did 39 knots on her maiden voyage. Which is damn fast. There are those who say the ship could do 50 knots. I've heard it. She made in excess of 50 knots. No one really knows how fast she could go. She was never really let, let loose. Wow, she must be fast. She's got some really big stacks. <laughs> Well, that comedian there is my producing partner on Lady in Waiting, Mark B. Perry, who's a, a, a very significant television writer in Los Angeles and one of the best people I've ever worked with. I met him with the advent of the internet. You know, up till then, I felt like I was the only person that remembered this ship, but I realized I thought I was obsessed, but I, now I realize I'm passionate. He's obsessed. Um, and. Through the internet, we discovered that there were hundreds and thousands of people that remember this ship. And now that there's an SS United States Conservancy, all of these fans are coming out of the woodwork and they're built, making films, uh, they're doing PSAs, they're doing music, and all kinds of other efforts designed to bring this ship back. And uh, when Norwegian Cruise Lines did not bring the ship back, um, they tried to sell it to some other owner who would bring it back as you know, a hotel or something. But when all of that failed, because she needs a lot of help, the ship was put up for scrapping. And 24 hours before the ship was sold for scrap metal, a man named Jerry Lindfest, based on uh, the awareness created by the film and by the SS United States Conservancy, called up the Conservancy's 800 number and said, how much do you need and who do I make the check out to? I'll sell you his phone number. <laughs> In any case, um, w right now the ship has a stay of execution thanks to Mr. Lenfest and the Conservancy, and let me show you how this turned out. It's a piece of history we shouldn't let die. Slated for the scrapyard, this legendary vessel that holds the transatlantic speed record is getting a second chance. Tonight it will look better than it ever looked. A symbol of America, her namesake, the United States. Let's do this.
this for our country before it is too late. A symbol of America. So now my friends and I own this ship. <laughs> and the good news is that there were three American cities actually vying to have this ship on their waterfront. Miami, Philadelphia, where it now is, and New York City, where they actually called us and would like to put it back in a berth very, very close to where it originally sailed from. Uh, so we're very enthused, but here's the uh, caveat. We have two years to raise the money to refurbish the ship and repurpose it as a, um, a hotel, a museum, convention center, whatever. Uh, but in two years, if we haven't done that, it will be the conservancy itself that will have to scrap the ship. And just one aside, what I discovered in doing my research on this ship is that in America, we can no longer build a ship like this, nor can we completely repurpose it here. We do not have the infrastructure to do that anymore. All we're capable of making now is warships. So that's something to think about. Now I'll change the subject. The electric guitar. <laughs> Part two. That's a 1959 Les Paul. That's the holy grail of the electric guitar. One of those things cost between half a million dollars and a million dollars. So I thought I was obsessed by the electric guitar, too. But then I realized there are people ready to put out that kind of money when you can buy a new one for about 495000 less. <laughs> so I did an exploration of the guitar and the obsession with the guitar and the energy and the creative energy that went into building it in the first place and the energy we all feel when we play them. And, uh, but don't take my word for it. There's uh, Kevin Bacon. Why do normal, rational people mortgage their homes to afford a particular vintage Les Paul or a Stratocaster? Why would a middle-aged guy in rural New Hampshire vault more than 2,000 of them in his barn? And why do players make those strange, contorted, ecstatic, orgasmic faces when playing solos. The electric guitar is magic. It goes beyond cultures, it goes beyond words, it goes beyond language. It is a pulsing, rhythmic connection to the essential forces of the universe. I can take you somewhere. It's like a euphoria. It's easy to get obsessed with this instrument, and I know that my producing partner, Doug Forbes, who's here tonight on this film, let, um, Turn It Up, uh, and I both have this obsession, and it's, it's actually almost a disease, and it's a disease we call gas. Oh, I totally have gas. I have gas, yes, I do. I've had guitar acquisition syndrome since I was 16 years old. I just did a photo shoot, so I have 108 guitars, but they're not crap. Now I probably have about 150 guitars. Between guitars, banjos, mandolins, it's around 2,000 guitars. I don't think a man ever has enough guitars. In several polls over the last few years, they've been shown to be the finest investment of any collectible. I wonder if I keep buying them, I'm going to be living under the freeway, but I'm going to have a really nice guitar collection. He already does. Um, so, I want to leave you with this. Uh, creative energy is a very powerful thing. Be aware of it, take a chance, and try to make a difference. Thank you very much.